I'm going to be attempting to do is actually talk about big data from the perspective of a user, of a large scale user. Uh, in particular, the context of our use is in uh, biomedical applications. Uh, what you'll see is in the, in the course as I walk through this, we'll certainly talk about how we're trying to bring the tools and technology to solve some of the vexing problems uh, associated with biomedicine. Uh, I will attempt to convince you that uh, uh, biomedicine is the, is the place to be if you want to be a big data scientist. Uh, that uh, we have probably one of the greatest untapped potential for uh, leveraging big data. Uh, but I also would actually argue more importantly, and uh, you'll see I quote Jeff Hammelbacher later in this, is, you know, that if you actually really want to be making a difference, that uh, big data actually in biomedicine actually has the, has the capacity to conceivably save lives. Okay, so with that, let me get started. My name is Ken Buteau. Uh, I'm uh, from Arizona State University. I'm the faculty there. I'm the Director of Computational Science and Informatics in the Complex Adaptive Systems Group, which is a mouthful in and of itself. So I, uh, I will give you a little bit of explanation of what the truck I mean by complex adaptive systems. Uh, I'm in the School of Life Sciences and uh, um, you know, miscellaneous other stuff at Arizona State University. My group, actually, overall at Arizona State is really involved and engaged, and actually has been uh, for actually most of my professional life, in this concept, the emerging concept in biomedicine of personalized medicine or precision medicine. Now, arguably, there's a difference between precision medicine and personalized medicine. Uh, regardless of which title you prefer to use, uh, I actually like to focus on what this is about. So personalized medicine is about getting the right individual, the right care at the right time in the right place. And those of you who are certainly familiar with big data capabilities, that's what most of the industry is about in doing big data. In most contexts, big data now not necessarily driving who should get what cancer drugs, but is about who should get what ads, or who should get what interventions, or who should get what pieces of information. So what we see is there's some tremendous opportunity to do this in the context of biomedicine. Now, in my field, Precision medicine or personalized medicine is revolution. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time, well, at the end of the talk, talking about how we're embracing this new capacity to do detailed molecular characterization. And I'll try to convince you why this is a big data problem. Uh, so unequivocally, personalized medicine is a revolution. But to my clinical colleagues, they actually believe it's really a renaissance, that uh, it returns us back to the place, despite of all the technology and all the quote unquote data we now have in order to inform and address disease and medicine, it's really a renaissance where now the physician and health care can be directed back to the individual and their individual characteristics, which is what the practice of medicine is in theory always been about, is how do I actually tailor and understand what my patient's disease is and how do I give them the best care. What I hope you'll be convinced, though, is that personalized medicine is a big data problem. And I spent almost 15 years at the NIH, and they are slowly coming around to the recognition. And you'll see as I walk through this partially why they're coming around to it being a big data problem. They initially hoped that actually that it wasn't going to be a big data problem, that it wasn't going to be a computational problem. Uh, I don't how many people here are physicians? Anybody here physicians? Anybody here molecular biologists? Anybody here in the biomedical sphere? Good, so I can ruthlessly <laughs> scourge my, uh, my, uh, my colleagues in this. But you know, many people who went into biomedicine in general, but I'll be crisp, that went into medicine in particular, went into it because they didn't like math. They didn't like computers. They didn't like doing statistics. Okay, So they have been dragged kicking and screaming into the era that maybe computational approaches have the capacity to provide answers that uh, simple based test tube turning at a laboratory bench doesn't. So let me 
at least bring this group up to speed as to why I'm saying uh, personalized medicine is a big data problem. Because I know this, probably, this group probably doesn't need to be convinced, but I think it's useful for you to know the dimensions when we're talking about biomedicine. And there's two reasons that I'm interested in sharing this, because biomedicine big data is, and I agree, I'm, I'm evangelical in this as well, big data approaches can be universally applied to almost anything, but part of the difference is the dimensionality in the context of biomedicine is different or slightly different than what we have in other big data problems. And I'll try to highlight that as we walk through here. So, so clearly the tools and technology, and you'll see we're applying them in biomedicine, are applicable, but it's not without some thought or without some customization and modification of the approaches that are necessary to make that work. So let me give you some of the biomedicine by the number. So, if we're going to do personalized medicine, I realize this doesn't project that well in here, but uh, first number that we need to worry about is the size of a human genome. Well, size of a human genome is three times 10 to the ninth base pairs, all right? So each one of you actually has, <coughs> excuse me, information encoded at the level of three times 10 to the ninth. Actually, it's times two, because you got one copy from your mom and you got one copy from your dad. That's a lot of bits of information. But what's important, one of the things I want to point out that's important to know is, well, any given individual has three times 10 to the ninth base pairs, that's big. What we tend to do in biomedicine is actually look at a small number of individuals, all right? small relative to the rest of the big data problems you're going to hear uh, throughout the rest of this conference. So a big biomedical study has a thousand people in it. An average biomedical study has a hundred people in it. So you're saying why is that important? Well, the reason it's important is because most of the big data architectures scale vertically. They're about having hundreds of thousands to millions of people with tens to hundreds to thousands of observations. So our problems actually in biomedicine are pivoted, all right? And much of the physical infrastructure, when you start talking about Hadoop and Spark and MapReduce, are all gauged to work on narrow, deep problems, whereas the biomedical problems are wide, shallow problems. So it requires us to reconceptualize at times how we actually deal with this physical infrastructure. And we even find as we're applying it that even simple things like error trapping doesn't always get caught in this large scale physical infrastructure because nobody ever thought you were going to do rows of three times 10 to the ninth. Okay, that's a, that's a big row uh, for anybody's database schema. All right? All right. So we tend to have, again, at this individual level, we can have as many as 3 million variants, i.e. those two copies of DNA I mentioned, differ in the copy you got from your mom versus the copy you got from your dad at about 3 million locations. And we routinely characterize these. So we have, again, rows of 3 million observations. Maybe at a slightly smaller scale, each one of us has approximately 20,000 genes. Again, a lot of columns in a database in which all these things are variable. Uh, we actually also have a large number of proteins, about 220,000 individual proteins. And these are now being routinely characterized uh, on a whole genome level. So in today's modern biomedicine, it's not uncommon to have this entire portfolio on one individual their entire sequence, all the variants, all of the proteins characterized, all of the gene expression. So you have a very wide data set on a very small number of individuals. Now, other data, big data that you hear about in biomedicine all the time, the hot new technology, it's not so new any longer, is doing whole genome sequencing. So big data is not only wide, but it actually in biomedicine is big. So when I do my three times 10 to the ninth base pairs, when I look at your sequence, it generates a file of about 725 gigabytes, okay? That's a big file, even for this audience. Uh, you know, that's not a trivial amount of data. It's hard to spin that, and not that there aren't laptops that will do this, but for one individual, we have actually uh, almost a terabyte of data every time we characterize your genome. And more pragmatically, 
Uh, this is the size of the assembly file, almost 300 gigabytes for each of these individual genome sequences. And if we look at a compilation of data, for instance, one that I'm going to be talking about later today, for instance, the Cancer Genome Atlas. This is where we have one of these multidimensional characterizations on, on about 500 individuals from multiple different types of cancer. It's 3.2 petabytes worth of data. So again, very hard to browse this uh, with traditional tools. I'm sorry? There was 500 cases per study. Approximately, yes. Yeah, but then, so there's, there's multiple studies, so there's... There's about, 20, about 23, 24 different cancers looked at. So if you do 20 times 500, yeah. that's the total number of independent individuals that have been looked at. But, but it's still a big... The point is it's a big number to have all that data accessible. Yeah, but you just, I just sounded like 500, so I was just saying it. Oh, no, no. I'm sorry. That, that's a, thank you for the clarification. Yeah, there's... Each individual study type had 500 individuals, yes. All right. So it's clear that the amount of sequence that's available is skyrocketing. And actually, part of the challenge, the reason that's bringing biomedicine into this universe kicking and screaming, is we recognize that there's tons of sequence. And this slide is actually, I, I quit trying to update it at this point. So I, it's easier to do it with words because it's easier to edit it. Uh, so on, in 2014, it's estimated that there were almost 250,000 sequences have been completed. So multiply this times that 300 gigabytes we just talked about a moment ago for having a complete sequence, and you've got a lot of data that you have to worry about. Now, arguably, uh, there's a big promissory note in this data set. And that promissory note, that, this may not translate well into Arizona, but I've come, I'm a Midwestern boy, so this is a large manure pile, okay? And there's a story, the reason I tell this, uh, but it is the promissory note of biomedicine and why we need to have you all engaged. So biomedicine has now generated almost, you know, 300,000 sequences over the last year or so. Uh, and this reminds me of the story of the little girl who uh, every day told her parents, I, you know, I want to have a pony for my birthday. I want to have a pony for my birthday. Okay? So each day she would tell her ponies that she wanted parents. She told her parents she wanted a pony for her birthday. That she, the day of her birthday arrives, the parents take her outside, show her this very large manure pile that's sitting out on the driveway. She enthusiastically dives in and starts swimming around and thrashing around. The parents take in a guess. They thought she would be disappointed, but instead she's enthusiastic. And they come up to her and say, why are you so excited about having this big manure pile? And she says, wildly enthusiastically, there must be a pony in here somewhere, okay? <laughs> okay? So I might argue that we are doing the same thing in our generation of this large footprint of data for cancer research, or name your other favorite collection. Of, there mu the cure for cancer must be in there somewhere. So I will volunteer. I am that little girl. I'm diving into this pile on a day-to-day -day basis. And I do live under the promissory note that we are going to get some unique things out of this. And I hope I'll convince you by the end of the talk we are starting to get some at least unique insights. But we won't do it without the engagement of you all and the big data community now coming to biomedicine and bringing your unique tools and skills to helping us ask and answer these questions. Well, I've mentioned the molecular data. The molecular data, I said, is only one component of big data in biomedicine. We also have uh, clinical information, so hospital records. If you go to an average hospital, uh, there's huge volumes of data in hospital settings. If we go to Biomedical imaging, any given image, and imaging is now increasingly routine and actually done sequentially uh, and over time. So we're building up a, and actually arguably all the numbers I showed for your genome, while big, are only one, are done as one snapshot. These imaging and other dimensions are being continuously collected and are likely only to get bigger into the future. We also know that there's an explosion in personal monitoring information. And we can't even begin to estimate what this is yet because it's still in its infancy, but it's speculated by, by 2018, uh, over 7 million of these things are going to be working routinely. I mean, I'm actually one of the, the uh, proponents of this, actually, that just monitoring this data, but it gives us a unique insight. So we are exploding in data. But 
part of what you guys are probably aware is the definition of big data is really soft. So I think I can convince you all, and the purpose of this was that this is real big data in biomedicine. Uh, on the other hand, I think uh, uh, John Miles White actually has it right when he says that really to any given community, big data is really what a community finds uh, to be so big that you can't manage it with standard techniques, okay? So why do I put that? Because in biomedicine, our primary data handling tool is Excel spreadsheets, okay? Uh, go into any lab across the United States, literally across the world, and you'll find that our primary data management, analysis, and manipulation tool is Excel spreadsheets. So any data that's bigger than, uh, that's bigger than a million rows by 16,000 columns, and I think you could see there's not a single piece of data that I described here that'll fit in an Excel spreadsheet, is exhausting our capacity. So, Part of what we've been trying to do at ASU is then say, we've got to start doing this differently. And to do that, we have worked at creating a first generation data science research platform that brings these kind of capabilities that you all do day to day in other domains into specifically the biomedical enterprise, but into the larger scientific uh, context itself. So what do I mean? When I say a data science research platform, it sounds a little geeky. Uh, and it's intended to sound a little geeky because that's what I do is a geeky. Um, so what I mean by this is we're all familiar with research platforms, all right? So the large headline collider for the physics community is a research platform. It does unique things to help you solve, ask and answer questions. For the astro, uh, for the uh, planetary community, you know, it's Mars rover. For Actually, even in my community, the next generation sequencers are actually specialized instruments that allow you to do specific things. That said, in data science in general, I would actually argue, we're actually just trying to retrofit the sort of computational, in particular, high performance computational infrastructure of a previous generation into the big data problems. So our point at ASU was, let's start with a clean piece of paper and say, if we want to do data science, what does that research platform need to look like? What is the capabilities of that need to be? So one of the things we immediately came to is that one size does not fit all. So I know it will be heretical for me to say this at this meeting, but you know, not every problem is ideally suited through Hadoop. Now, you'll see that I'm clearly a big advocate and a big proponent of using Hadoop, but let's not delude ourselves that there are not some problems that are still best dealt with in traditional MPI, high performance computing capability. More pragmatically, to just simply ignore what exists today and only jump into this new universe ignores you know, two decades, three decades worth of software and capabilities that exist. Just say everything we're going to do in the future is Hadoop. Or we could say everything we're going to do in the future is Hadoop, but we can't start with a data science environment that is only the Hadoop large-scale framework. So what we've done at ASU is try to create an integrated hybrid environment that's somewhat future-proofed, that embraces the best of all possible worlds in a seamlessly integrated way. So uh, it has physical capacity, ultra-high bandwidth networks, both internal connects of our physical infrastructure, as well as equally important to us, high performance connectivity to the outside world so that we can do hybrid cloud and leverage computational resources that aren't physically in our data centers. Uh, we actually connect through internet two at 100 gigabits to the larger world, so we can essentially be connected to any other high performance universe as if it's on, uh, most sciences can be connected as if it's on their desktop. Uh, and again, literally at ASU, it's as if it's on their desktop because many of the interconnects in the buildings are only like one gigabit. So, so, so in the background, 100 gigabits actually connecting you to compute resources is giving you transparent access to really important components. Uh, we have large-scale storage measured in petabytes. We have uh, approximately three petabytes of total storage so that we can reposit and manipulate those data sets. We have multiple flavors of computation. I'll go back to this in a second with a little more detail and hybrid cloud. But also important in this, and 
this audience, I actually don't have to convince you of this, but you'd be amazed at the number when I go to supercomputing that I have to tell you that computing is not just the physical hardware. This group doesn't need the convincing of this, but, but at many audiences, they say, yeah, you know, just get the computer. We don't need to worry about the other logical framework. So part of our components here are, you know, having the right logical framework. You'll hear me talk about the Hadoop framework in a moment. We've created a novel metadata management framework uh, that allows us to manage our data lake in a manner that captures the semantics and the complexity of the data so that we don't just have difficult to assess large collections of data and its semantics. And of course, this requires people. So actually, I put this on here not just so that I can put pictures of nude people on the slide, but actually the missing component when many organizations are planning is that you've got to have the right team to do this kind of work. So let me walk through this a little bit. So here is the physical architecture of what we use. You can see the traditional high-performance computing up in the, uh, I guess from your side, it's the upper left corner, it's about uh, committed to this resource is about a thousand cores of uh, state-of-the-art Intel processors. Uh, on the right-hand side for you, you can see we have a Hadoop data cluster, a 40-node cluster uh, that actually has, uh, is also connected to this. In the middle, you see we have a management space for all the transactional needs of our community that can facilitate them doing their day-to-day -day manipulations, software development, and other components. And then at the bottom, you can see we have uh, high performance, high reliability, high availability storage of about three petabytes. And all of this is connected uh, on a very fast, common fabric. So it's all in one network space. And the reason that's important then is it allows us to do, to go, a user to go seamlessly between these environments. So if you have an MPI class job, you can run it in the MPI class environment but it can write back to the Hadoop file system. Or if we have Hadoop components that just need some utility computing, we don't need to do everything in the Hadoop space. Uh, we can manipulate data and manage it in other ways. If we wanna just have repositories, flat repositories of standard data, we don't need to actually have that or necessarily capture it in the Hadoop space. We can, so we have a great deal of flexibility and allows us to go back and forth uh, between all these different environments in a seamless way. Shown here is uh, the sort of software definition of our framework. So this is a software defined data center and you can see the individual components, high performance, Spark, Hadoop. We also in this have a GPU cluster because a number of our classes of jobs are truly that class of simple computational high performance. We manage and interconnect all these components with the foundational layer of OpenStack. We use SDN, uh, software-defined networking, and OpenFlow, actually then to share and communicate and interconnect our applications. And then through these, we can actually uh, connect through internet to and leverage uh, both the hybrid cloud. And now our cloud models at ASU are both commercial groups, so we actually have a direct relationship right now with Penguin, where we're actually using and sharing loads between our local capabilities, but uh, have hopes to also be working with Amazon, Microsoft, and other groups, all, all work in progress. But the other piece that's important for us in this universe is it's not just simply that we want to connect to the commercial cloud, but for instance, I was just uh, literally two days ago, was in Mumbai, India, and talking to CDAC, their high performance computing group. And part of what we're gonna be doing nearly immediately is they, they're on the internet to backbone. So part of what we're gonna be doing is creating bridges between different institutions that allow us actually to work in a, in a federated framework to interconnect our data, our resources. And in particular, this is important in biomedicine because we can't, and for a lot of good reasons, don't always want to move the data to where the compute is. In biomedicine, quite commonly, you can't move the data from its current location. You actually have to move compute to the data. So in this instance, we can actually seamlessly move around in our containerized environment, particular analytic frameworks that allow us to do different things. So our general architecture for this is uh, leveraging and borrowing what is, I, I think our colleagues at MAP are, uh, have been embracing as their broader framework, the Zeta architecture. We have minor variations on the theme of this, but that said, we're all deploying this integrated framework uh, that 
collects, you know, has these uh, different, these uh, six different points of view uh, that combines all of our different uh, types of information representation, uh, enterprise application solution architecture, different models by how we do computation, uh, as well as different ways in which we do data representation. So, but again, all seamlessly integrated. And those of you who are not familiar with Zeta, this is largely borrowed from our colleagues at Google, who, uh, who, uh, uh, you know, in a remarkable moment of generosity, actually share out how they actually do their work. And this has now been made open and public source. Uh, we actually, as I'd mentioned, are critically interested in hybrid activities, in particular, hybrid cloud for physical capability storage and or, to be honest with you, one of the reasons we're interested in interacting with our colleagues at CDAC is they have actually untapped human resources, that they actually are looking for interesting problems. So you'll hear it as a recurring theme, and I'll give this you know, question to you all. We are looking for partners. We are looking for people who have interesting uh, questions and problems that they are interested in having solved using big data tools or have expertise and big data tools to help us solve our problems. And we're doing this through this collaboratory infrastructure. So one of the other novel things about the NGCC platform is not only its physical and logical infrastructure, but its business architecture. So its business architecture is uh, we want a hybrid collection of people who are willing to play together in a common framework. So uh, obviously I'm from ASU, we care about academia, uh, but we actually also realize that government, and we're actually talking with a number of governmental agencies and programs that we will actually be probably providing support for, as well as industry and commercial groups. So we're actually interested in both providing support to and getting support from and working in close connection with industry group. And members of the collaboratory do all sorts of, make all sorts of types of contributions. I list here, uh, they can give capabilities, they can give data, they can give expertise. Of course, we never hesitate to take money or actual real resources, but, but that said, that's not the prerequisite for playing in the collaboratory. The prerequisite is that you bring something to value so that we don't have the tragedy of the commons in this space. All right, so that's the core framework. But what I want to do is spend the remaining time uh, introducing and actually translating this into a context so, so that it's not just about the hardware or the software or even the people in this instance, but how are we taking this approach and this problem to uh, solve critical issues in biomedicine. And borrowing, excuse me, borrowing from Harper Reed, you know, it's not about big data per se, but what can we do with big data? And part of what our group is interested in doing is sooner rather than later is demonstrating that there are unique things we can do in biomedicine uh, by embracing the big data approaches. So I decided actually, and so it's a little bit of a riff from my abstract, but uh, moved and actually I was literally moved and also inconvenienced by this this morning as I was trying to come in the breast cancer walk. This is breast cancer awareness week. Actually the big walk and run is actually happening in Tempe as we speak. Uh, so, so I wanted to focus the talk and so I did have cancer in the title, but what I'm gonna do is focus the work we're doing in breast cancer uh, and how we're trying to bring these big data approaches literally to ask and answer questions uh, that we hope will give us novel insights that just aren't present right now with traditional approaches. Just a little bit of information background by, you know, by the numbers here a little bit, continuing our by the numbers theme. Uh, about one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. Uh, it's continuing to be a public health problem. It's not just some rare esoteric component. It's a, actually a, still a very real uh, threat to health in the United States, the developing and developed world. Breast cancer is a disease of middle to later age. Uh, uh, most women uh, in their 40s or 50s uh, are at the primary risk window and your risk continues to go up. You can see it until, uh, until the end of your uh, sixth decade. Uh, so, uh, and again, after sixth decade, the risk starts to go down, but you can see it persists all the way throughout a woman's life. But here's the slide I think that's 
in some sense most telling and interesting and complicated. So this is the, uh, over the last 40 years, what's happened to breast cancer, okay? And what, what you can see is, I always point this out, the war on cancer started here, okay? So these are the mort mortality rates of breast cancer. I, I won't say we've had no effect uh, in breast cancer. Uh, I might say in African-American women, we've had no effect. Uh, and in fact, breast cancer, we've had not made a dent in survival associated with breast cancer in African-American women. There's been about a 50% reduction uh, in breast cancer deaths uh, over, the last, uh, over the last 40 years, uh, which, is, it's, which is not bad, but it certainly isn't what the promissory note was going to be. Uh, everyone had hope when the war on cancer was declared almost 50 years ago that we were going to eliminate cancer. That's, there still is the, I was at the NCI for almost 15 years. The, the mantra was eliminate suffering and death due to cancer. And this doesn't look like we've eliminated suffering and death due to cancer. Uh, even though we're spending at the NCI about five billion dollars a year and that's just the NCI's investment it doesn't deal with Komen it doesn't deal with all these other groups and when I say five billion just to be precise that's not just on breast cancer but overall in cancer uh, we've had a, a less than exciting impact on this now you can see one of the things that's gone up here is the incidence of breast cancer. That's almost assuredly, at least that's what most people describe it, is a context related to screening. Screening for breast cancer, and in particular mammography, has been considered to be a life scent, a life saver. Uh, this is one of the many things you can see. Mammography saves lives. We're actually aware that you can actually detect and capture and reduce and get real breast cancer by doing this routine mammography. So that increase that we saw in incidence had to do with higher surveillance where we were actually seeing and detecting more breast cancers than we're seeing before. Now, you may be surprised then if you see this, and I don't know how many people here read the regular newspapers, or I'm not sure uh, that you can avoid this, although I actually, this made it, I was in India last week, this made it all the way to India, so I'm guessing that it's uh, actually it may have made the local newspapers here, is despite all of our, everything we hear about the importance of mammography and screening, uh, the American Cancer Society this week, or I guess it was literally this week, said, yeah, we're not gonna do so much of that anymore. Okay, you're going, now wait a minute, it saves lives, it detects cancer, why aren't we gonna do screening anymore? And it's not, a co ironically, even though cost arguments can be made, it's not a cost argument. The problem that we're having with mammography is that it has lots of false positives. So we can see tons of stuff in mammography, but we don't know what it is, all right? Uh, we don't know which is a good lesion, which is a bad lesion, what lesions need to follow up. And basically, since this is a somewhat quantitative audience, what ACS, the American Cancer Society, did in reducing its screening recommendations is all they did is say, try to calculate with a reasonably complex equation is how much screening can you do so that the adverse effects of screening are weighed or equaled or balanced with the benefits. So it's not that early screening doesn't have benefits, but it also has costs. So what they've done is set the guidelines so that, it's a, so that the risk equation's awash. And the reason they have to do that is we still, in 2015, can't say which lesions or which women need to be screened even. We can't, so even though we've had 40, 50 years plus the war on cancer, we have the molecular re revolution, uh, we have all of these components that despite tremendous effort, uh, simple gene signatures have just failed to distinguish high-risk individuals uh, or lesions. We just can't still today do this. And uh, again, maybe a little too colorful, but at some level, it's an epic failure. I mean, we've invested and in, given our best minds to this, but we still can't distinguish this. And you could, all, you could possibly argue that the ACS position is a retreat and sort of an admission that we really can't do this as well as we hope to be able to do. 
I'll also foreshadow that we're about to embark on, we've similarly had this problem with PSA and prostate cancer. And to be honest, we're about to create this problem in lung cancer because there's a whole new imaging techni technology called spiral CT that's gonna be doing exactly the same thing in lung cancer. And again, in lung cancer, we can't say today which lesions are good and which lesions are bad. Well, our failure in this, and the reason, uh, it's not actually my words that are actually saying this is epic failure. You don't have to trust me. You can trust this Harvard investigator, okay? Uh, Robert Weinberg is one of the, you know, the, the true pioneers in the molecular characterization. And he basically has said, I give up. We can't do this any longer. Uh, the models we're using, the molecular characterization, everything that we've said was going to cure and eliminate cancer actually just ain't working. Okay, so this was in, in my literature cell is like one of the most prestigious journals. Uh, so this is sort of Weinberg's lament that basically all their hopes uh, that we would actually be eliminating cancer by the, the import of these molecular technologies just have not been fulfilled. Well, actually even Weinberg admits that one of the reasons this is, and you can see it even in the title, uh, he initially thought that molecular biology was going to make cancer simple, okay? But let's be crisp. Cancer is anything but simple. It's complicated, okay? Uh, in fact, it's very complicated, and you'll see I'm going to use a term, I'm going to define it in a minute, but it's not only complicated, it is complex. So let's start with the complicated piece first of what's been recognized, okay? So for instance, we can see that cancer isn't one disease, and when we say breast cancer, it's dozens of diseases at the molecular level. In particular, breast cancer is now, depending on how you want to characterize it, and again, in the tertian, when we talked about those thousand individuals that we'll be talking about with breast cancer, it's, there's even though they all had breast cancer, there's dozens of different diseases in there at the molecular level. Uh, they contain hundreds of alterations that vary from individual to individual. So one woman's breast cancer tumor, when you do all the mutations, isn't the same as another breast tumor. It actually, they each have hundreds of mutations that overlap in a small number. But more important, and I'll point to this segment, is it changes over time. So cancer isn't a disease that actually, you look at it once, it's not like an infectious disease where you have a particular agent and you know you're treating that agent. Cancer is, uh, is rapidly adapting and changing constantly. All right? So all of these properties are the hallmark definition of a complex adaptive system or a complex system. So cancer doesn't behave by simple rules. And even though we as scientists hoped that simple rules would work or that we could wish simple rules onto cancer, it turns out that it's just not playing that way. So let me give a, an example, let me just broadly define what defines a complex system. So part of what defines a complex system is that it's driven not by individual events, but by interconnected uh, relationships, interconnectedness, and correlations between many things. It's got many complex interacting parts. Uh, the key thing about a complex adaptive system is it displays emergence. Now, emergence doesn't help most people when I say it's emergence. What do I mean by emergence? Emergence means the whole is more than the sum of the parts. So in a complex system, one plus one equals three. Or more pragmatically, or even complicated, one plus one equals zero. So I might have these two effects, but then I don't get something. So you, it doesn't have simple arithmetic uh, interactions. It's, it's complicated, all right? Uh, and so this emergence phenomena is part of what we need to worry about. And part of, to date, what's been missing from cancer research. We have hoped that by simply looking at individual genes that we would be able to solve the problem. And we haven't had the capacity or the data sets, to be honest with you, to actually look at how these pieces might come together. So part of what I would actually argue big data infrastructure offers us is the capacity to no longer have to take everything apart because that's the only computational tools we have, but to actually look at the problem as its whole. So I, again, am a uh, rabid enthusiast for uh, the power of big data to ask and answer questions. And I guess part of my 
faith uh, is reinforced by the sort of tens to hundreds of billions of dollars of capital that are going into this space to actually ask and answer questions in lots of other domains. The hot areas across all the economy, largely except biomedicine, is in the embracing of uh, the big data capabilities. So part of what we want to do here then is not unlike, so think of the mammography problem. It's not different than what Wanamaker was facing and what actually big data is being applied to today uh, in almost every other context. It's all about advertising, right? So, so most of the big data infrastructure is about trying to figure out who should get what in order to enable better success. For one of my gear, it was making a sale, okay? But I would actually argue as a cancer investigator, it's about giving the right care or knowing who should get mammography, all right? So I think the problems are actually quite isomorphic, given though what I'd said earlier about the dif differences in our problems. So it's not a transparent application. So part of my goal here today, uh, the reason I like this conference is I'm trying to recruit and entice you all to be part of this problem. So, so again, to paraphrase uh, Jeff Hummelbacher, you know, I, I know most of big data today is not being applied in these contexts. What I would hope you all may be able to, uh, but through some of these problems, see interesting things that you all, from the areas that you know or you're interested in, could actually help make this transformation take place by bringing big data in a routine way to the biomedical enterprise. Now, I mentioned to start with that part of the concept of looking at big data and complexity is that complexity needs us, we need to look at interactions. And very little work has been done to date in the biomedical space in looking at interactions. But it's increasingly clear, especially since the Cancer Genome Atlas or the TCJ, that in fact, cancer is behaving and using network properties. So it was observed very early on that from tumor molecular profiling, I just mentioned, there's hundreds of mutations with very low recurrence rates. Uh, and that simple gene signatures were not distinguishing the different states. They were not reproducible. You couldn't just look at a simple panel and understand what was going on. But what they observed very early on, that if you project this complex data on networks, and I realize no one here is a, perhaps is a biologist, but suffice it to say, this is just like a social network, just like some interconnection collections. And what they could see is, individual actors, and if you look on the top, and I realize it doesn't project well in this room, but you can see most of those mutations occur in less than 10% of the individuals. But you could see that the RAS pathway, this network, is changed in 88% of the cancer. So small sort of noisy things took on coherence when you actually start to look at them in the context of networks. So we at ASU are attempting to now do this on steroids uh, with, not, with actually looking at the comprehensive data sets and trying to calculate the genomic architecture of cancer. And in this instance that I'm going to talk about today, that I'm going to give you a, we're, we're at our first look at trying to evaluate this. I don't want to pretend that we have the answers. Uh, uh, if we did have the answers, I'd be probably filing my patent applications or talking to a drug company today, but we actually are making progress, we think, in understanding the difference. So the specific problem we've been working at is looking at a piece of the TCGA data, the breast cancer data and TCGA that has, in this instance, the breast cancer data set has about 1,100 individuals in it. Uh, each individual has the data set that we're looking at has about almost a million variations associated with it. So each person, as I opened with, each one of those thousand people is a vector that has a million different, has a million different uh, uh, DNA locations that vary. It's a big data. Each one of these is, you know, it's a big data footprint, so about 3.6 gigabytes. We also, for each of these individuals, have information on their gene expression values, all right? Uh, but what we've decided to do, which uh, again, hasn't largely been done in the past because uh, it just, there weren't the computational capacity to do it. We've decided to try to map the architecture. How do these pieces interact with each other in normal or non-tumor and in tumor? And 
Similar to doing network analysis when you're doing fraud detection or when you, we're trying to then see how do the networks behave in cancer and non-cancer and can we start to look for systematic differences that are happening at the network level. So our platform is using, uh, uh, oh, we've created an open source big data pipeline based on Hadoop. So we store all of our resources in the Hadoop file system. Uh, we're using the Hortonworks open source distribution in this instance, so just so that we can share it with our other colleagues uh, without actually having to go through, uh, so that we can be broad and actually have this be clonable. Our analytic engine, we're using the basic Spark tools. Uh, in this instance, the whole library of machine learning tools that are part of Spark, so it's all being done in memory. Uh, we're doing our storage in Parquet, a very compact way to actually store these, you know, almost three, 32 billion uh, outputs of these computations, uh, but queried then through Hive. So we actually have a Hive interface that, sits, that actually communicates to the underlying Parquet representation uh, and then use actually visualization for, in, in this instance, Apache Ambari. We actually use as, the, as just sort of a simple query visualization web-based tool. So I can actually have undergraduates at ASU, smart undergraduates, mind you, but that can actually manipulate and play with this data uh, through these class of web tools. You don't need to be a PhD uh, in data science in order to be able to do this kind of work. So what I will share with you, I, I you know, could put up you know, tons and tons of uh, validation stuff, but we've run pieces of this pipeline in the traditional high performance computing environment and using the traditional genomic analysis tools that would be available. And I can say that small piece of this required CPU wall clock days to actually do even tiny pieces of this, all right? What I can tell you in this environment, it takes hours. So we actually have an order to an order and a half reduction in computational time. But more importantly, when I mentioned that we have 32 billion rows of data that we generate out of this, through the Hadoop framework, we can actually do queries that return out of this 32 billion row table in single digit minutes. So we can do very complex queries that return in single digit minutes. Whereas if we, well, I can't even imagine what you would do this in a traditional relational database setting or without actually having the capacity to use these class of tools. All right, so just a quick snapshot. I apologize for the ugliness of this slide. Uh, actually, I had a better presentation, but I realized it was wrong last night when I was looking at it. It's the danger of doing, doing uh, graphic presentations while you're uh, on an airplane. Uh, but one of the things I'll show, this is actually measuring the, in looking at our expression, the relationship between DNA variation and expression, we can look at it in tumors and non-tumors. And even to the simplest of eye, what you can see is the tumors are behaving differently. They're behaving actually quite differently in terms of the complexity of their networks. So what you can see here is the tumors actually have many more edges. Uh, than the non-tumors. So just across the board until you get to essentially so loosely connected pieces that that's where the, uh, the non-tumor sort of takes over. But the tumors actually have hundreds to thousands uh, of additional network connections. They're, they actually have a different network pattern. And again, not surprising to this group who might be familiar with fraud detection or other dynamics of social networks, the network structure makes a difference. So it appears that the tumors are using or framing the networks differently. Where this is most striking is in the next slide, which is a little cleaner presentation. Um, you can see here now where we plot the, for on the top we have tumors and then on the bottom we have non-tumors, excuse me, on the top we have non-tumors, on the bottom we have tumors. You can see here in the non-tumor uh, the number of genes at these very highly tightly connected network nodes, there's only like five genes that are being controlled by a relatively small number of DNA locations. Whereas when we look at the tumor, we can see that it's actually almost 20 times more things that are being changed by about 50% more locations in the genome. So the network, it's not only more connections, but the topology of the networks 
appears to be different. Now, I'm not going to pretend we know what to do with this yet. This is sort of fresh off the presses. You guys are seeing it early. But why and how cancer is changing, I mean, those of you who might be biologically oriented, uh, the argument is being that it's activating a whole bunch of, for instance, embryonic or developmental networks that a normal breast cell wouldn't be having available to it. Uh, but this is actually was a surprising effect to us because we'd actually speculated that in fact tumors may have fewer constraints when you looked at their networks rather than more interactions. So, please. In, implicitly in this, but. Yep. Building yep. All right, that's cool. And enough data points from to do that, yep. Those cancers are different, right? Yep. Yep. So if, I say, if, if, the, if the differences were subtle here, we'd have to wash our hands. But the fact that it's dramatic here was interesting. We actually, all I'm saying is, we sort of expected there to be differences. I had expected that that we were going to see that the uh, well, and I can. As a, any good biologist, I can rationalize what we're seeing here is that in a normal cell, it's actually under control. So you don't, and it's actually not doing much. So, whereas a cancer cell now has lit up a whole bunch of stuff. So, a normal cell, relatively well, differentiated, it's got its yep. you know, homeostasis, yep. and yep. cancer has gone non differentiated. Yep, it's doing all sorts of other crazy stuff. It's lit up a whole bunch of other processes that make it a cancer. And actually, in 2020 hindsight, that's probably not that surprising. We know from Weinberg and Hannah, Han Weinberg from earlier, <laughs> Hannah, Hannah and Weinberg that cancer needs like at least six or seven different processes to become cancer. But the problem with Hannah, Hannah and Weinberg is they couldn't get resolution to get what would actually the underlying. This actually looks like it's lighting up reproducible differences. And part of what I'll show you is then just lastly, before I go to summary and take questions and I'm on time. So here's the networks that actually, this is actually a graphic presentation. I apologize, it doesn't display well, but you can see. So this is actually a cartoon of just the very tightly coordinated networks. Uh, and we can see cancer lights up a whole bunch of other fragments. And what I can tell you from, it's not immediately obvious, but it's a really boring graph. That's why I didn't put it up. Given that there were only five genes and 117 variants, Normal doesn't look anything like this. So these are all the new networks that have been lit up by cancer that weren't present. And our promissory note is now by looking at these in more detail, can we actually see what's going on with a different lens or with a different resolution than we saw at single gene signatures or certainly with single variants, single, uh, single mutations or single points in time. So with that, I want to quickly summarize, I'm just trying to stay on time, so given that we started a few minutes late, uh, we think that personalized medicine is unquestionably a big data problem, that cancer is a complex trait, but that by applying these big data tools, I think we may be able to ask and answer questions in new ways, uh, and that by embracing the complexity and the kind of network analysis that we can do through big data frameworks, we may actually be able to make novel findings. So I'll close while we take a couple, I have a few minutes for questions. Uh, again, part of the reason I'm here is I realize most of you all aren't biomedical people or whatever, but have tremendous expertise in the big data space. Our interest is trying to figure out how to make that handshake with people that maybe can give us unique and novel insights uh, in the big data space that will help us transform uh, the biomedical landscape. So with that, thank you.